Good morning and welcome to Beth Haven Baptist Church in our adult Sunday school class. We have been teaching on trials. We are actually on lesson number seven and I know I did not finish the lesson last week, so I'm gonna get right off on into it this morning. So if you will, please take your Bibles and open up to James chapter number one. James chapter number one, we'll review just a little bit and then get on in and finish off the message today. James chapter one, verse number one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Father in heaven, we do thank you for uh, the word of God. We're thankful for the encouragement and the comfort we receive from your word. Lord, you know that uh, we do go through trials and tribulations in this life, and we are thankful that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you give us wisdom and uh, guidance to help us see the light at the end of the tunnel, to help us to see Christ more clearly in our lives. And uh, Father, I pray that you'll help us to live and walk by faith and not by sight. I pray that you'll bless the teaching and preaching of your word uh, today. I pray that you'll encourage those that uh, may be watching uh, at home and have not been to a church service uh, lately. Lord, that you'll encourage them to come to church. Being, I know we have services on Sunday evening and on Wednesday evening as well. And Lord, we're thankful for the opening up of that. And we look forward to services on Sunday morning as well soon. And uh, Father, we just pray that you help us to give you honor and glory and uh, draw us closer into thy presence today. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have been talking about uh, factors which influence stress or peace in trials. I believe last week I mentioned three factors. Yes, today I have added a fourth factor uh, that influences how we react to trials, uh, whether we get bent out of shape or whether we're able to go through with them with a peace and a calm spirit. Uh, we mentioned last week the first factor uh, is that of faith. We need to have faith in God, trusting in Him, not going back and forth. We know that verses 6 through 8 talk about the double-minded man. We need to ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And we mention that double-minded people, those letting their emotions block out their vision of God, and confidence in him will kind of be riding like a roller coaster feeling of up and down, up and down in their faith. One moment they feel great, uh, the next moment or the next day they feel terrible and they're thinking about how bad their situation is, how that it could possibly get worse and why are these things happening to me? And then they respond in faith again and they're encouraged for a little bit of time, but they keep going back and forth uh, because they don't have a firm foundation of faith. The Bible says uh, these double-minded people that allow the feelings to get on in there and influence them, that they will be unstable and they will be prone to discouragement and stress over and over again. We need to live and walk by faith. Jesus said to Martha, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. He was encouraging her to believe. Jesus had already said, roll the stone away, or he's getting ready to say, roll the stone away. And Martha's like, no, nah, he stinks. You know, he's already dead and he stinks. And Jesus says, if you believe, you will be able to see the glory of God. God is great. God is glorious. God is awesome. God is wonderful. God can do anything. We need to believe in God, who he is, and how he is able to take us through the storm or be with us in the midst of the storm. There will be something, some glory, some further revelation of the greatness of God 
to be gleaned from the trial. If we respond in faith, we will be able to see the glory of God in the midst of the trial. We see that in Joseph as the trials that he went through, being sold by his brother, sold into a slave, taken to a faraway country, falsely accused, put into prison. Uh, we see that that seed of faith was always there with Joseph, and he got to see the glory of God and see how God brought him through everything to put him into a place of authority where he could be a blessing and encouragement and a help uh, to his family. We see that in Job as well. When Job had lost everything that he had and his and, uh, uh, children in the family uh, uh, died and his cattle were taken away and even he got very, very sick, a low, a difficult trial that he went through, and yet he was able to see the glory of God as God literally spoke to him and brought him comfort and brought him through the trial and blessed him so mightily uh, at the conclusion of the trial. In some of the deepest trials that we have experienced in our life, we have seen God's mercy and God's power uh, revealed to us, oftentimes in answer to prayer, that we needed something uh, desperately and God was able to provide that need and uh, just see how great God is because he knows about our needs and he cares for us and he answers our prayer requests. Even in something as tragic and difficult as the death of our son, uh, a very hard thing to, uh, to go through for my wife and I, but yet it did bring a fuller and a greater understanding of the great love that God has for us. Because not only did he have to experience the death of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he did it intentionally. He did it purposely. He allowed his son to go through that suffering and, and uh, uh, to die on the cross for our sins. What great love God has for us having to go through such a tragedy and experience those feelings for himself. So we're able to see the glory of God as we respond in faith. If we respond in doubt and wondering about why this is happening, we won't be able to see the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God in the midst of the trial. We need to respond by faith uh, to the Lord. And then there's a second factor that affects uh, whether we feel stress or peace in the time of trial, and that is flexibility. I want you to notice verses 9 through 11 in James chapter number 1. The Bible here says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his, in his ways." Now, at first, it may seem like these verses are unrelated. What does the rich man or the poor man have to do uh, with trials and with faith? Uh, but they are not unrelated. James is merely making an application to the problems uh, that many of the believers were experiencing in their trials of that day. Some had gone from poverty uh, to great riches, and others had gone from riches to a place of great poverty. In other words, there was a dramatic change that had occurred in their life, and that change was a trial for them. Uh, you can write this down. Change uh, is one of the top producers of stress. Change, things like the death of a spouse, uh, a marriage, the beginning of, of a marriage, moving to a new location, finding a, a new job. All of these things can be serious trials in our life. They're often hard to deal with, uh, but uh, I can change. God can help me to be flexible and to adapt to the new situation that I am involved in. Uh, when I got saved, the Lord began to change me. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter uh, number one and verse number six. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and turn there real quick. Philippians chapter one and verse number six. 
The Bible say, there says, he being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God began a great work in us on the day of salvation, and God is going to continue that great work of conforming us to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. And that work is going to be continued into the day that our bodies are changed and renewed, and uh, we are like the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. All right, so God begins to change us, and he's going to continue to do that. But I want you to notice in the Bible, there's many examples of people who went through great changes in their life. Some reacted well uh, and had faith in the Lord, and others did not react too well and were more fleshly in their reactions. I want you to think of a couple of examples uh, with me of people who went through great changes in their life and reacted properly. They, uh, they responded in faith to the great change that they were going through. Uh, you think of uh, someone like Ruth. Uh, Ruth, her husband had died, and she was given the opportunity or the choice to stay there in Moab with, uh, with relatives, with family, or to go back with Naomi. Uh, to the land of Israel, which she had never gone through. So she went through the death of a husband, and then she went through a great move from one country to another country, from one culture to another culture. She was the outsider trying to fit in. They did not have very much money, very much income coming in. She had to basically work like a slave out in the fields, gleaning uh, the, the drops of of the gleanings uh, that were just left there from the workers. And so there's great changes in her life, but she responded in faith. She told uh, Naomi, where the, thou goest, I will go. Uh, thy God shall be my God and thy people shall be my people. She made a clear choice to accept the Lord God and to accept the ways of the Lord God. And so everything turned out well for her. God blessed her there. God took care of her needs. God gave her a great husband. God gave her children as well. Uh, so God greatly blessed her because she responded by faith. Uh, we could talk about Joseph. Joseph went from being in a very rich uh, family to all of a sudden being a slave and being in prison. Um, and yet he react reacted well and God brought him back to a position of power or authority and riches in his life. Uh, Daniel, we could talk about, he had a great change in his life as he moved from being um, having freedom in his own land, in his own country, with his own family, to being taken away, kidnapped, taken away into a foreign country, and uh, there not having uh, uh, riches anymore, but being just like a slave in a foreign land. And yet God blessed him there because he had faith that God was in control of the situation. So there are many examples of people that reacted great to change with faith in God and God blessed them for the reaction and God can do the same thing for us. If we walk and live by faith, then God will bless us in that situation. There are also individuals who went through a great trial, a great change in their life and uh, they reacted in a fleshly manner rather than in a manner of, uh, of faith. Sarah, Abraham's wife, of course, she had to leave her home. She had to be like a pilgrim in a strange land. Um, there was a time of famine that they went through, and they lost faith. She lost faith in the promise of God that she was going to be able to have a son uh, in her older age and said to Abraham, take my, uh, my handmaid Hagar and go in unto her, and maybe God will bless you through her because God's not blessing you through me. And she lost her faith for a time, and that created problems between her and Hagar, between later on her children and a and. Hagar's children. Uh, it created a lot of problems and heartache in her life because she did not respond by faith, but she responded by doubt. We could talk about King Saul as he uh, is chosen to be the first king of Israel, and it seemed like he was humble at the very beginning. Uh, but then as he became king, he had a new job, he had new responsibilities, and it all overwhelmed him, and he began to make decisions out of the flesh, and they were decisions that went against God's will, and he became a very sullen man, a very angry man, a very jealous man, or a very envious man, 
and uh, he had lots of problems and lots of sorrows in his life because he did not respond in faith. We need to be flexible to the changes uh, that occur in our life. We need to be able to adapt to new situations. God is going to be with us no matter where we go, no matter what we go through, God is never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. God is always going to work all things together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. In verse number 12, in fact, uh, it talks, uh, James is talking about faithfulness and enduring temptation. He says in verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So they're going, this person is going through a time of uh, temptation, a time of trial in their life. There's changes taking place in their life. But God is saying, just be faithful, just endure, just keep doing what you know is the right thing to do. Keep up your walk with the Lord. Keep reading the word of God. Keep being faithful to the uh, services of the house of God. Keep doing what you know is the right thing and God is going to bless you as you endure the temptations and trials that come into your life. How important that is. But I want you to see another truth uh, found in verse number 14 that also leads to overcoming stress and trials and temptations. Look at verse number 14 for here it says, let me go back to verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Of course, temptations never, ever, ever come from the Lord. Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts. Again, talking about the flesh, living in the flesh, when he's driven away of his own lust and enticed. So we see another thing here. Uh, oh, let me go on. Uh, letter C is foresight foresight or discernment, discernment. I need to have discernment in my life as a Christian. I need to see, is this a temptation that is coming from the world or the flesh or the devil, or is it a trial that God is using in my life to build me and bring me closer to the Lord Jesus Christ? God never comes to us with drugs or alcohol or porn and says, you know, try this. God doesn't give us any desires for anything that is evil or that would hurt us in our life. It says, neither tempteth he any man in verse, 10, verse 13. So where do these temptations come from? Where does sin come from? I want you to notice the four steps uh, to sin. Number one is desire, desire. Verse 14 said, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That word lust is like a desire, a general word for having a desire. And of course, there can be godly desires. He that desireth the office of a bishop, a pastor desireth a good thing. There can be godly desires. There can also be ungodly desires. And that's what's being referred to here in verse number 14. The Holy Spirit, of, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God are going to show us if it's a good thing, if it's a godly desire, or if it's a bad thing, if it's an ungodly desire. And we need to be careful. Matter of fact, write this down. The more we want something... And the more we think about what we want, the harder it's going to be to resist that. We can't keep thinking, I wish my life were better. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I wish I lived here. I wish I had different uh, parents. I wish I had more money. I wish I had a better job. I wish, I wish, I wish. The more we keep thinking about that, the harder it's going to be to resist uh, sin in our life. All right, whether it be smoking, drinking, or just something simple like getting that candy at the checkout counter when you're going through the line, uh, that desire, the more that you see it, that's why they put it there, because they want you to see it, they want you to think about it, because if you see it and start thinking about it, then you're going to grab it and you're going to put it on the cart there and, uh, and pay for it, all right? And pay for it in more than one way is oftentimes. All right, so number one is desire. Number two, we see the second step of sin is deception. The Bible here says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And the word drawn away has the idea of baiting a trap, 
the word enticed means uh, to bait a hook. And so the hook or the trap is hidden, kind of like you hide the worm in the hook when you're going fishing. The enticement, the worm is very clear and you're attracted to it, but the hook is not noticed. And so when the fish bites into the worm, he gets the hook and that's the way that the devil catches us as well. He makes sin to look so attractive to us, but there's a hook that's in there that's gonna try to trap us and bring addictions or bring problems into our life uh, that we find it's hard to get out of. Write this down, that uh, getting caught or trapped is the consequence of sin. Getting caught, have that hook catch you, is the consequence of sin. Now, the sin actually began when the wrong desire was entertained in the mind or the heart rather than being cast down. The Bible tells us we are to cast down the wrong thoughts, the wrong uh, imaginations, anything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. We are to cast those things down and to our, we are to replace the wrong thoughts with praise, with thanksgiving to the Lord, or with thoughts like we see in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, lovely, pure, uh, etc. We're to cast down the wrong desires, uh, sinful desires, and fill our our mind with gratitude and thanksgiving uh, to produce a feeling of contentment within our heart. Failure to cast down those wrong thoughts leads to being caught in wrong thinking, which is going to produce the consequences, which is the result of sin. And all sin has consequences. We may not face them immediately, but sooner or later, we are going to have to uh, face those consequences and pay for the sin. But our flesh is so strong, we oftentimes do not ask, what will happen if I drink this, if I take that, if I watch this, if I go with this person over there? We don't ask the right kind of questions. We don't have the right discernment in our life. And we only see the pleasures of sin and not the consequences uh, of our actions. And when that happens, when we see the pleasures but not the consequences, we don't think about the consequences, we are truly deceived and we'll be living a deceived life as well. We could ask ourselves some questions like, I was deceived. Is that really a valid excuse to say, I just didn't know, I just didn't understand, I was deceived, somebody tricked me, somebody fooled me. Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 14 about the woman Eve who was uh, deceived when the, uh, when the serpent came and, uh, and encouraged her to eat of the forbidden fruit. And of course, she faced the consequences uh, for that sin. Write this down. Temptations come when we are drawn away. Temptations come when we are drawn away of our own lusts and entice. Listen, the closer you are to a source of temptation, the easier it is to give in to that temptation. So don't go to a bar where alcohol is served. Don't allow yourself unfettered access on your TV or on the internet. We need to prevent ourselves from being drawn away into temptation. Otherwise, the situation gets harder and harder. What if Adam had built a fence around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, so that Eve could not get close to it and not see its beauty and not begin to lust after it? Sometimes we need to build some fences into, into our life so that we are not enticed, so that we won't go near a place where we are likely to be uh, enticed. If you don't go out on the ice, you're never going to fall in. Don't give the devil the opportunity to draw you away from the spiritual influences in your life. Because Satan knows we can be drawn away. And that's what this verse of scripture is saying. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Yes, we can be drawn away. None of us is so spiritual and so great that we are beyond uh, the ability to give in to temptation and fall into sin. And we could list a whole number of very, very spiritual people that would be looked up to and honored and regarded that just got themselves in the wrong situation and fell into sin. And uh, 
and uh, fell away from the Lord as a result and experienced the consequences of that sin in their life. Satan knows he can draw us away from God's word, uh, from godly people, and our spirit will be weakened and we'll be ready to give in to temptation. So we need to beware. Desire, deception, and then the third thing that we see in this passage is disobedience. Verse number 15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, we see that it brings forth death. Disobedience uh, occurs in the will the body's actually made up of uh, the, uh, the, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And the soul is made up of our intellect, our emotion, and our will. When we talk about desire, desire really comes uh, with the emotions. Deception attacks us in our intellect. And then we see disobedience, and disobedience is an action of the will. We make a decision to close our eyes to the consequences, to not look for the hook, to not look for the trap, because we really want it, and so we're not on guard anymore for the ways that we can be tripped up. We bite and we're hooked or we are in the trap. Don't be deceived by the devil's lies or by your own heart. Let me tell you, there are a lot of lies of the devil that are very, very common today. For instance, it's not wrong to think something bad as long as I don't do it or as long as I don't say it. It's okay to think it. That is a lie of the devil. Uh, sin is committed, lust is committed in the mind, what we think about. It's not a sin to think adulterous thoughts because I'm not really hurting anyone. But Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, told us that it is not just to commit uh, adultery, but to lust after a woman in our heart, that also is adultery. The Bible says that lust brings forth sin, not later, but at the time that it is conceived. And then that sin brings forth death. And that's the fourth step uh, in sin. And that is death. And we understand that death is separation, separation from the Lord. The moment lust is conceived, you have uh, sinned and separated from God, hence the need to confess that sin regularly so that we can be drawn back into close fellowship with the Lord. When we feel like we're not close to the Lord, when God, maybe it seems like God's not speaking to us through his word and maybe he's not hearing our prayers, either we are deceived and not trusting the Lord or we have sinned and we've spiritually turned our back on the Lord, and we don't sense His uh, presence, His closeness anymore. It's hard to uh, a fellowship with someone that you have turned your back on. We need to repent, turn back, confess sin, and of course God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and restore unto us the joy of our salvation. So we see in this passage that we need foresight. We need to see if this is a trial or if it's temptation. I need to see if it's a temptation, I need to be have discernment and looking for the trap or the hook that's involved there. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a wise man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple, they're not even thinking, they're not even looking for that trap. The simple will just pass on and be punished. In other words, they'll suffer the consequences uh, for not having wisdom, not having prudence, not having discretion in their life. James tells us in this passage, dealing with trials, we need to have foresight, we need to have flexibility, we need to have faith. If you look at the men and women who successfully overcame trials in their life, people maybe like Joseph and Rahab and Esther, you will see faith, flexibility, and foresight. Like Joseph, when he was going through his trials, he understood all of these things that happened unto me. Well, guess what? God meant it for good. He had faith in the midst of the trial. And we also see uh, the faith of Rahab, 
uh, when she understood that God was going to destroy the city of Jericho because they were evil and they were wicked. And Rahab had faith that I know that your God is going to do this and I know that your God can protect me, that your God can save me. She showed faith in God Almighty and God blessed her uh, for the faith that she had. We know when we look at Esther, uh, that Esther had to be very flexible. She had to risk her life. All of a sudden, Mordecai is coming to her and telling her, you know, that there's a decree out and all the Jews are going to be killed at a certain day and you have to go in and talk to the king so that this decree can be renounced or, or taken back. And Esther's like, well, wait a minute, I can't go into the king because if he doesn't hold out his golden scepter, then, uh, then I could be killed as a result of it. And uh, she had to be flexible and say, well, wait a minute, let's take a little bit of time. Let's pray about this. And uh, then I will go into the king. And she did. And God blessed her and God brought uh, salvation or deliverance to the Jews as a result. And so we see we need to have that faith. We need to have that, uh, that uh, foresight uh, as well and that flexibility. All right, there's a fourth thing that I wanted to mention today as well. And that is uh, having to do with fellowship with the Father. Let's begin in verse number 17. The Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So we see here, beginning in verse number 17, it's talking about God and what God is like. James is trying to remind the believers there, yes, you're going to have trials. You need to respond in faith. Uh, you need to not be wavering, going up and down. You need to be aware of the temptations that are going to uh, come from the devil. You need to have that flexibility. He's teaching them all that. And then he's starting to talk about the father. OK, what is the father like? Get your mind and your attention on the heavenly father, not on all the trials and tribulations and things going on around you. And remember that God is immutable. What does that mean? God cannot change. Uh, we see here in this verse, verse number 17, it says with him, there is no variableness. And the word variableness means that he is perfectly consistent and constant. He cannot change who he is. God is gracious. God is merciful. God is long suffering. God is good. God is kind. God is great. God is gracious. God is ever present with us. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. That's who God is. And he never changes who he is. Even in the midst of the storm, God has not changed one iota, one uh, little bit. God is good and holy. He is just. God blesses the upright. God rewards us according to our works. That's not just the way he worked in the Old Testament. That's the way that God works today. He ensures that they who sow to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You'll always know how God is going to act, how God is going to feel, how God is going to respond to different situations because he always does what is right, what is good, what is perfect. He does what his word says he's going to do. It cannot change because he cannot change. There is no variableness. Letter B, there is no shadow of turning. There's not the least likelihood, not even a shadow of God uh, uh, turning in our uh, direction or turning away from us. Some say that there are two things that are sure in this world. You know what they are, death and taxes. Everyone dies, that's for sure. And governments will never stop collecting taxes. At least that has been the experience uh, that we've had. Even now in the midst of a crisis, uh, some have proposed uh, reducing their salary and others are like, wait a minute, you know, we're here in Congress and you want us to reduce our salaries. No way, that is never going to happen. Uh, our salaries need to go up. They need not to go down. And so taxes are never going to be uh, uh, taken away because then they would lose their job uh, and their uh, reason for being there. All right. The time will come, however, when death shall be no more. 
The time will come when we're in the presence of God and pain and sorrow and death will all be things of the past. Uh, they will all disappear. The time will come in Christ's kingdom where there will be no more taxes. Those things are not really sure, death and taxes, because they will end, they will pass away. Well, you know what will never change? The person of God. God in his personality, God in his actions do not change and cannot change. And because uh, God cannot change, that also means he cannot improve nor regress. He cannot get better. He cannot get worse in anything, meaning his love uh, cannot change. He's not going to love you more today when you are praying and reading the word of God and going to church and serving him in some kind of ministry and then love, love you less if you stop being involved in this ministry or miss a day of reading the scripture. Oftentimes we look at it that way, you know, that, that God loves us more when our actions are better and he loves us worse when our actions are worse. No, God's love does not change. We will face consequences for not loving God, for not serving God faithfully. There will be consequences for that, but those consequences have nothing to do with the love of God. God loves us as his children. He accepts us unconditionally. That has not changed. That will not change in a million years. God cannot love more, nor can he uh, love less. And so, because God's character does not change, we find a couple of truths. The first truth we see is that we can trust his person. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. God does not change in who he is. If God rewarded honesty on some days and then rewarded dishonesty or deceit on other days, we would not be able to trust him. We honestly are in a country that... Uh, that usually hates flip-floppers and politicians that break their promises. I remember going through the Kavanaugh trial that we had not too long ago, and some said you must always give women the benefit of the doubt and let this woman come before uh, the Senate and be able to testify and, and share her story with us because she needs to be believed, she needs to be heard. And then all of a sudden some accusations go out about uh, uh, Vice President Biden, who's running for the presidency, and now all of a sudden they're changing their tunes and saying, no, 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 we believe the vice president, we need, don't need to hear from this other person that's making an accusation. And they just flip-flop, they just change the way that they are. Aren't you glad that God does not change? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With God, he is always 100% trustworthy. We can trust his person. And then secondly, we see that we can trust his promises, the promises of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 20. Let's go ahead and turn there. We'll look at a couple of verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, yes, and verse number 20. The Bible there says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. All the promises are yea and amen. They all are what they say to be. Uh, they cannot change. Those promises cannot be broken uh, in any way. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 13, just before the book of James, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So these individuals mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, men and women of faith, they believed the promises. They accepted the promises. They received the promises and they risked their lives. They went out uh, uh, from one land to another doing things that, that would seem like everybody else to be uh, crazy, but they trusted in God and God watched over them and God protected them and God bless them in a great way. All the promises of God are true and they all are going to come to pass. Praise God for the promises that you have already uh, been able to claim. Promises regarding answer to prayer, 
promises uh, regarding uh, things that, that, that God is going to give to us, like the fruit of the Spirit and comfort uh, and help and wisdom. Uh, so many things that God has already done for us, but there's so many promises that are yet to be uh, claimed by us, like the promise of being called away uh, to be with the Lord, the rapture, uh, being with the Lord in heaven. There's so many great things still yet to come, but we can trust the promises of God. And then thirdly, we see that we can trust his principles, the principles found in the word of God. Isaiah chapter 40, go ahead and turn there with me. Back into the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter number 40 talks about the Lord and his greatness in Isaiah chapter number 40. In Isaiah 40 and verse number 8, the Bible says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but... Uh, uh, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The word of God shall stand forever. His promises cannot be broken. His principles cannot be broken. The Bible says in John chapter 10, in verse number 35, the Lord Jesus said uh, that the scripture itself cannot be broken. When God has a principle in his word, like sowing and reaping, you are going to reap what you have sown. We've seen that in the life of Jacob and so many others, some for bad because they sowed bad seed. They reaped a lot of consequences and sin. Uh, others uh, sowed good seed and God blessed them and God rewarded them like Daniel who became a president in the land where he was kidnapped to. He became one of the rulers of uh, that land. So we need to follow the principles that are found in the Word of God. You don't have to lie. You don't have to work on Sunday in order to prosper. God will take care of all of your needs because He's promised that in the Word of God. God's change, God never changes His principle. Do right. Uh, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will provide for you. He will bless you. He will keep you. Uh, he will lift you up. So we can trust in His principles. And then fourthly, we see that we could trust his purposes, his purposes. Still there in the book of Isaiah, turn to Isaiah chapter 46 and verse number 11. Because God has not changed in his purpose, his plan for our life can be trusted. We can trust in the purpose that he has. Isaiah 46 and verse number 11 uh, actually, verse number 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God fulfills his purposes and his plans. Who can stop God in the plans that he has made? Did the devil thwart God's plan in the Garden of Eden? Maybe he thought that he did, but he didn't. It was the fulfillment of God's plan in sending a Messiah, a Savior, to die for our sins. Did the devil get the victory when he uh, attacked Job? No, he did not because God blessed Job in the latter end and God gave Job a whole lot more wisdom through the trial that he went through. How about uh, Jesus? The devil attacked Jesus. Finally, the devil rose up people against him uh, to, uh, to beat him, to capture him, and to put him to death. Did he get the victory? No, that was all part of God's plan as well. God's plans do come to pass. We can trust God with our life today because he has a master plan. Never be afraid of following the will of God. What we need to be afraid of is acting outside the will of God, is getting away from God. And then we see how we are to be uh, like God. Knowing God is great, but God doesn't want us just to know him. He wants us to be like him. The Bible says in verse number 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. 
that we should be a kind of first fruits unto his creatures. So God begat us, he born us into his family. We were born again into the family of God so that we could be like him, so that we could be uh, Christ-like, one of his creatures created in his image, uh, following him. We're kind of like the lion cub that features, that has all of the features of the lion of the tribe of Judah. How do I reflect God's righteousness? How do I have his discernment? How do I have his proper judgment in my life? Well, James tells us, and this is a very important because we live in a world that doesn't care very much for truth or righteousness or justice. And sometimes Christians live more like the world than they do like the Lord Jesus Christ. But James gives us six actions here that reflect God and help us to be right and make right judgments. And these will help us not be ruled by our feelings or by our circumstances, but by the Spirit of God. So the Bible tells us, let me just give you the first one. I know we're running out of time. The first one found in verse number 19, which says, uh, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. There's actually th three things that are included there. We need to be swift to hear. We need to have an open mind. We need to be slow to speak. Uh, we need to as it says, think all that you speak, but don't necessarily speak all that you are thinking about. A man's silence cannot be quoted against him. We need to uh, be quick to hear. We need to be slow to speak. And then the third one that we see here is we need to be slow to wrath. And I mentioned a couple of reasons why we need to be slow to wrath. Uh, but I want to encourage you to uh, go through the rest of James chapter number one and see three other things that are found there that God wants us to be like him, that God wants us to be doing in our life. Um, and in doing these things, we won't be pulled from side to side. We won't be confused in the trial or the temptation that we're going through. God gives us commands and principles that he wants us to follow. And as we follow these things, there is a peace in our heart and there is direction for our life. So we don't have that like a wave of the sea being tossed to and fro, going up and down in our life. Instead, we go in a certain direction, the direction which God had tells us to go after in our peace. Uh, we will have peace in our life and we'll have calmness in our heart as well. I want to encourage you to finish reading that first chapter of the book of James. It's a great chapter and God is revealing so much to us so that we can have victory in the storm in the time of trial. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.